Good evening and welcome to the world today. Uh, my guest is Pankaj Misra, a writer who lives in London, born in India of Indian origin and still very much involved in the politics and intellectual circles of that country. Uh, as he is uh, in London and uh, New York, Pankaj Misra is an essayist, a writer, a novelist, writes fairly regularly for most of the uh, important uh, literary magazines, the London Review of Books, the New York Review of Books, the New Yorker, the Guardian Saturday Review, etc. In his latest book, Age of Anger, History of the Present, Pankaj has tried to grapple with the big issues that we face today. What is civilization? What is Western civilization? What is religion? What is the state of the world? Why is there such a huge mess? Extremely important philosophical issues. And in some ways, the title is a bit misleading because it's not, it shouldn't be taken as a history of the present. It is, in fact, looking at the present through a concentration also on similar debates and occurrences that have taken place in the past. The book has also been published in Barcelona, in uh, the Catalan region of Spain, under the title of La Edad de la Ira, uh, which will be useful information for our Spanish language uh, viewers. Pankaj, welcome. Very good to be with you. Thank you. Um, the book reminds me of a saying by Walter Benjamin that there is no act of civilization which is not simultaneously an act of barbarism. I mean, it's a very striking formula, and many didn't quite know what Benjamin meant, but your book really <laughs> is an explanation of that aphorism. Uh, so describe in your own words why you wrote the book and what its central thesis is as you see it. Well, you know, I started writing the book uh, when Narendra Modi won elections in India, which was the first sign, at least, you know, for, for many of us in India, that, you know, Hindu nationalism, or you may also call it a form of new fascism, was or had finally triumphed after you know trying for for many many years and that came as a huge shock to many of us who had thought of india as a relatively stable democracy uh, where formations of the kind uh, modi represents were simply not viable um, or would not be accepted by the masses at large. But when large numbers of people, including members of my own family, many of my friends, many of my closest friends, uh, voted for a man who is guilty, at the very least, of uh, you know, a range of crimes, if not mass murder, if not actually uh, the massacre of uh, hundreds of Muslims in 2002. So that came as a huge shock and you know, made me think more deeply about so many things that we had simply taken for granted in India, thinking that, oh, we have democracy, uh, a form of civilization to go back to Benjamin's uh, quote, that democracy cannot produce an outcome like that. I'd simply assume that without really taking into account the whole range of results, outcomes that democracies have generated in the past. I've written so much about this Modi regime and uh, previous regimes in India and elsewhere. But let's go deeper, let's go back to the late 18th century when the modern civilization we live in today was actually formulated. It started to come into being in the 19th century with industrial capitalism. But its principles as ideals, those of competition, the pursuit of self-interest, uh, all of these notions, uh, the emphasis on commerce, on trade, um, all of these things that were theorized 
in the late 18th century. Um, I felt I had to go back, re-examine that, and in that, my guide was Rousseau, who was um, an internal critic of the uh, late 18th century Enlightenment, uh, the first man in, in many ways to say that, look, this new modern society of modern civilization that is coming into being has a great potential for, for barbarism. Uh, and that seems to me uh, an insight that modern history has verified. And Rousseau, of course, apart from many other things, um, said and wrote that politics was extremely important. The slander against him by his opponents of the time that he wants to return us to a state of nature was a deliberate misunderstanding of what he was actually talking about. He was very critical of that statement and mocked it in his own way at the time that saying, you know, only these people, my opponents, could say that a state of nature means that man should return to the jungle. This is not what he meant, of course. He meant the improvement of society as a whole and how that society was to be achieved. What drove you to Rousseau? In your book, later on, you uh, explained that you were reading Nietzsche and he described Rousseau as a plebeian against uh, <clears throat> the more uh, snobbish, uh, slightly posh Voltaire. Uh, what was this passage and where? Well, it's a, you know, it's a very peculiarly uh, Nietzschean phrase or, or opposition that here is Voltaire, the representative of the victorious ruling classes with his uh, faith in the civilizing effects of commerce and, and reason and scientific knowledge. And here is this man, Rousseau, from outside Geneva, an outsider in Paris, who basically resents the cosmopolitan elites of which uh, Voltaire is the perfect embodiment. So this is a you know, very particular construction that, that Nietzsche brings to this uh, debate, and he knows on whose side he is, that he is on the side of the victorious ruling classes. But it did actually make me think that there is something about this debate that needs to be re-examined. And you're right in that Rousseau saw very clearly that this new society, this new commercial society built upon individuals pursuing their self-interest, and only you know, some, kind, some sort of individuals, mostly men, uh, certainly not slaves, certainly not women, a whole lot of people were gonna be excluded from this. So his emphasis on the political, on the duties of Citizen, citizenship, on the sense of belonging to a particular political community, of actually constituting a political community, which is what the social contract is all about. Because he realized early on, in many ways, uh, we are witnessing the consequences of neglecting politics today. The dangers he pointed to, which is that a society that is premised on competition, mimicry, vanity, the pursuit of wealth and status, these things, these ideals are going to leave human beings utterly exhausted, corroded from within, angry, disaffected. And in a way, he was brilliantly perceptive about our present moment today, uh, where we've seen a kind of excessive emphasis, especially in the last three decades of neoliberalism, on yes. thinking of society as a marketplace, <clears throat> with the political being marginalized. And the political has now returned in the form of the far right. So the link between the past and the present, past ideas, past predictions, with what is happening now is very clear. Absolutely, absolutely. But what is now happening, Pankaj, is a related uh, set of events, which is that the triumphalism of the West after the big victory of capitalism in the 90s, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the turn taken by the Chinese, uh, made millions of people feel, made them feel there's no real alternative left. And there was a huge demoralization which affected everyone. And so there is no alternative, the, the slogan of the Thatcherites and the Reaganites and the Blairs, you know, we are doing because this is the only path forward, imploded 
in 2008 with the Wall Street crash. And then in the vacuum, politics came back, people groping. Uh, grasping for answers, trying to see uh, which way forward. But this, as you've just said, gave us Modi in India, the largest democracy in the world, and Trump in the United States. I mean, very different people in terms of origins, their ideas. I mean, Modi belongs to a cadre party of the far right, with links to fascism, ideological links to fascism. And Trump, of course, comes from a maverick tradition of right-wing republicanism, which he's now discrediting at a very rapid rate. And what is there in between? What could come out from the pause now, which has been created by the Trump-Modi uh, connection, and also Pankaj? When the West don't like a particular ruler, there's no, you know, the entire media is turned against him. I mean, look at Duterte in the Philippines. Not that I like him, but I'm just saying the treatment of him, because he's been associated with mass killings, and compare that to Modi, who has also been, but no problem at all, whitewashed, invited to the United States, etc. I'm really shocked by the um, silence, relative silence, of uh, many, many uh, distinguished figures in the Western media about Modi. Whenever dictators, authoritarian leaders are mentioned in the Financial Times or the New York Times, they take care, it seems, to edit out Modi's name. Uh, that he's not spoken of, although, as we know, right now as we speak, uh, this incredible assault is being uh, conducted in India on all kinds of institutions, all kinds of democratic institutions, civil society, NGOs, uh, human rights advocates, universities, uh, universities of course, are, are, are under siege. But you wouldn't know reading some of the Western media, so it's, it's incredibly shocking. I do think, I mean, I think the point about socialism is its historical role was to civilize the worst effects of capitalistic competition of capitalistic societies. And after 89, with the collapse of uh, Soviet communism, and then the systematic delegitimization of socialist ideas, whether of compassion or solidarity, I mean, that's what socialism offered to many people who were suffering from the effects of this barbaric um, competition. And that meant they had no recourse to any set of ideas that could actually, or movements that could protect them from this brutal regime inaugurated by neoliberalism in which we're all supposed to be individual entrepreneurs uh, competing in the marketplace. And I think uh, in, 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 in an interesting way, the rise of the far right today which, as you say, happened in this vacuum post-2008, also has you know, created conditions, the same set of conditions, are also favorable for the rise of socialistic movements on the left who actually offer an alternative, as opposed to some sort of you know, um, vague, centrist solutions of the kind Macron is offering in, in, in France, which are doomed to fail, of course, and which can only while failing, help the far right. Uh, so this is also a historic opportunity for the left to break free of this, essentially this impasse of centrism in which so many you know, mainstream uh, left parties in, 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 in Europe have been trapped. And also you know, in countries like India, the Congress, um, the Congress basically lost its raison d'etre when it embraced neoliberalism. Um, when it abandoned this old post-colonial project. But Pankaj, for a long time after the collapse of the 90s, one felt that somehow the left intelligence here in India was immune to the process, that they were untouched, the parties carried on, the CPM winning majorities, forming governments in West Bengal and Kerala, uh, chat in Delhi, more or less the same whenever you visited. That now has also been badly dented and affected. What do you think could happen in India? Because it's all the parties which participated in the national movement, the independence movement, uh, have, if not completely disappeared, suffered such heavy blows. 
Congress. The Congress, of course, prostituted itself to a single family, which was crazy. Many people warned them about it. But both communist parties uh, <clears throat> have also declined. And what emerges is somehow social movements which create parties. Uh, but they, they do some things, they promise a lot, and they don't go any further. I think it's a big problem with the mainstream left. I mean, you know, like the Congress, it was compromised, even corrupted, by long years in power. When, you know, they actually lost touch with their base, mm -hmm. and uh, which happened, you know, very vividly in, in West Bengal, for instance, um, where they had kind of created a base, for instance, with land reforms early on. And after a kind of generational shift, demographic shift, they began to lose touch, and they had been in power for too long. And they did not really re-examine many of their assumptions, many of their ideas. So it's a big crisis right now that the party is actually capable of mounting resistance to the far right in India are in a terrible state right now. And I think, you know, for me, the only hope really lies with social movements, whether it's minors, indigenous people, uh, people protesting against nuclear plants. Now, of course, there is no political party that is capable of combining, you know, all these disparate movements into a strong political force at present. You know, things are still pretty bleak, but I think it's important that these organizations, these movements exist in India today. And that is the other side of, you know, what... what... Let's uh, discuss the United States for a bit. Because when Trump was elected, there was, of course, shock and horror uh, amongst establishments in Europe and the United States, uh, liberal grief, lots of people crying. The number of very sweet, nice liberal Americans I've encountered since Trump was elected apologizing, saying we are sorry, uh, please forgive us. But, you know... I felt then, and now it's more or less, again, Martin Wolf writing in the Financial Times that Trump is no different from a normal right-wing Republican president. Well, that's a bit wrong, because I think he is different in the sense that he takes the mask off. Whereas others try to disguise it with highfalutin talk. Trump doing the same thing, defending the rich, bombing the Arab countries, uh, Syria, which made him popular again with the liberals. Um, but basically, in terms of what he says, he says it more offensively. But if you look at the Nixon, if you listen to the Nixon tapes, it's rife with anti, with uh, anti-Semitic, Semitism, racism, you know, vulgar prejudices of every sort, likewise Reagan, even Clinton was capable of making racist remarks, etc., etc. So why do you think this reaction took place in the States? I mean, you know that country more than me, you go there more often. How do you explain this liberal response? The fact that Trump comes after eight years of Barack Obama during which all kinds of illusions were reborn and flourished, illusions of American exceptionalism, uh, illusions of American benign commitments to the rest of the world. And Trump coming at the end of that eight years of, of, of fantasy has basically taken a lot of masks off and, 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 and kind of revealed um, the sheer... Uh, brutality and, and violence with which the American system often works, not just in different parts of the world, but within the United States. And I think that for many people is extremely upsetting and shocking because, you know, with, with uh, someone like Barack Obama, who in office actually expanded the different wars um, that the wars. United States is, is fighting in, in, in different parts of the world. He was berated for not going into Syria. He did actually go into Syria. Exactly. Um, but he was berated for not doing enough by the liberal, many, many members of the liberal intelligence here. And he, of course, won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize, another uh, ironical uh, prize awarded by the Scandinavians. And, uh, you know, all this kind of helped create this image of uh, a very cultivated, educated, um, self-aware president. And while, you know, the dirty work went on behind the scenes, and I think with Trump, there is really no gap 
between reality and illusion. And that, for many people, is just too hard to take. So I think he does represent some very important continuities with previous regimes, with George W. Bush, with Bill Clinton, uh, and, 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 and of course, you know, previous regimes, Reagan and Nixon. But many people do not want to acknowledge that. They want to see him as a kind of monstrous aberration from an otherwise benign and beneficial political tradition. So you think it's a sort of a deep psychological shock, an earthquake, that from Obama, probably the most inventive apparition of the American empire, you shift suddenly to a total monster, and they can't take yeah. it. I mean, Obama was a kind of seductive embodiment, a kind of, of a new liberal chic. And here is this uh, man, a kind of spray-tanned, tax-dodging plutocrat from Manhattan who made his name with all kinds of um, and, you know, incredibly uh, dodgy deals. Um, in many ways, he does represent the world that we live in today. And that is something we don't want to confront. You know, I say the same about uh, Modi in India, exactly. that he was not a break. He is not a break from what went on before. No. That he also represents very important, deep continuities with previous regimes who claim to be liberal. Ask the Kashmiris, they, those regimes were not liberal. Those regimes were as brutal as the ones um, that, that, that sort of batter them today. Let's come to a, a more contentious part of your book. Uh, which has been criticized uh, by uh, li liberal critics, in fact, leading cosmopolitan liberal critics like uh, Michael Ignatieff in the New York Review, accusing you of being an apologist for ISIS, etc., etc. If I understand your book correctly, what you are arguing, and do correct me if I'm wrong, is that this tradition of terror is nothing to do with Islam as such. It has existed in Europe uh, for a long time. Mike Davis has told us in a book on the car bomb that it was actually first carried out to terrorist atrocities in the States. Uh, Ronald Fraser in his book uh, on Napoleon's cursed war, the Peninsula War in Spain, says that the first suicide bomber was a Spanish patriot who went and exploded himself. So it's an old tradition. And that, in fact, elements of this are anarcho-Islamism. But to say that, it's, it's almost, it's a very deep-rooted uh, liberal prejudice, that to try and explain something is taken to be justifying. So what was your reaction to that particular review and sort of similar remarks made by others? The liberal intelligentsia, um, especially the, the, the uh, kind which essentially turned into laptop bombers uh, post 9-11 and uh, advocated various wars, um, offered refined ways of torturing human beings. Now this liberal intelligentsia now claims to be the defender of liberalism against its enemies. The enemies have been identified as religious fanatics, mostly, mostly Muslims. Now this particular uh, opposition, liberalism versus its enemies, or the West versus its enemies, is the dominant discourse uh, of the last 15 years, which tries to explain uh, a lot of violence in the world as it exists today. Now this has been completely shattered by the rise of extremist organizations, figures, movements within the heart of the modern West, which have nothing to do with Islam. So people are now recognizing that um, violence or, or terrorism or extremism that used to be identified with the Muslim population is now much, much more widespread than we had previously thought. So the people who'd been vending uh, this particular interpretation, who had become very close to powerful people with their offering their interpretations, are in a panic right now. So these kinds of accusations, I take that as a sign of desperation, that you're a jihadist sympathizer, that you are justifying their cause. We, we heard this uh, soon after 
9-11, a kind of McCarthyite and tactic. The Iraq war. And the Iraq war. It was leveled at Susan Sontag. Anyone who tried to say anything about foreign policy, about history at that time was labeled as a terrorist sympathizer. So this is a, this is a tactic that has been repeatedly. <coughs> I agree with you, but it's very frightening if the intelligence agencies of the West aren't aware, and I don't believe this, I think they are only too aware, certainly British intelligence is, that one big reason for many young Muslims turning to terror tactics and uh, adopting uh, terrorism as a way out is a direct response to the wars that are being fought in their world. How can it be otherwise? No, we're not justifying the tactic. We're trying to explain how Western policies, both foreign policies, imperial wars, and increasingly domestic policies are creating this mess. But this is, you know, this is why I think um, the figures who have cheerled these wars that created Al-Qaeda in Iraq, Islamic State in Iraq, uh, it was the Iraq war. They, these organizations did not previously exist in Likewise these places. Afghanistan. Exactly. Uh, so they, they, they have to resort to these desperate rhetorical moves where you attack anyone who's trying to offer an explanation of being a jihadist sympathizer because they cannot acknowledge their own role in creating international terrorism. And this is what we see over and over again with the neoconservative intellectuals, with the liberal internationalists, all their wars fought for the cause of democracy, creating disorder, wherever those wars are waged, uh, unleashing all kinds of unpredictable forces, including uh, various terrorist movements. This is, this is the story of the last uh, few decades. And <clears throat> the other thing which I, it doesn't puzzle me because I know the answers really, but it's very uh, dispiriting uh, that so many U.S. citizens, this is more applicable to the U.S. rather than Europe, I have to say it, but so many U.S. citizens, liberals, not just liberals, people well to the left of liberals, are so caught up in the empire in a way they don't even understand. It's subconscious, if you like, that judging a president exclusively by what he, I say he because there hasn't been a she so far, what he has done internally is the main priority. The number of people killed in South America, in Africa, in Asia, doesn't count. So all those atrocities can be forgotten. Just the other day I was saying to someone who was sort of denouncing Trump, and I said, fine, 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 but still now he hasn't killed as many people as Obama, Bush, Clinton. And there was a shock, because you're not meant to count this as part of US policy. I mean, that just sort of, I find completely horrific. Well, it is, you know, uh, the response of people who feel uh, culturally very close to figures like Obama, for instance, who reads, who reads books of the kind um, liberal middle classes like to read. He reads The New Yorker, he reads the books mentioned in The New York Times. Um, so it becomes very easy for them to forget that this is also a man who used to look at kill lists sitting in the White House. And this is all, you know, I suppose part of normalizing the brutal machineries of empire, which grind on, you know, regardless of who is in power in the White House, in different parts of the world, um, in, in, in different war zones, with all kinds of unpredictable, terrible consequences for people who live in those war zones or who live in the vicinity of those war zones. But these are the facts of the contemporary world that are very carefully shielded or filtered when they do enter the United States. And you know, the media, the way in which it covers those events, um, essentially helps create this little bubble in which many, many people um, in the United States live, uh, really completely shielded from these um, horrible realities of, of, of America's role in the larger world. Pankaj Misra, thank you very much. Thank you, Barry.